On Wednesday, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin pleaded guilty to federal charges of violating George Floyd's civil rights. So now uh, Chauvin uh, ple uh, previously pleaded not guilty to that charge. Uh, now that charge, of course, stems from the murder of George Floyd when he had held his knee on Floyd's neck for about nine and a half minutes that led to his death. And by the way, the other officers that were with him are also facing this charge. Now, Chauvin was convicted of in state murder charges of manslaughter. Uh, he was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison in that case. Uh, the federal charges are different. So understand that there's two different cases. Uh, we already had the state case in Minneapolis uh, or Minnesota. Uh, and now you're gonna have the federal case that involves civil rights charges. And so those actually um, might add another hefty prison sentence to uh, Derek Chauvin. So he's not getting out for a, for a long, for a very long time, very long time. So now the federal charges included two counts alleging that Chauvin had deprived, uh, deprived George Floyd of his rights by kneeling on his neck as he was handcuffed and not resisting, and then failing to provide medical care when he well, basically had uh, realized that George Floyd was dying and then had died. So three other officers, Thomas Lane, uh, Jay Quang, and Tao, uh, uh, Tao Thao, uh, were indicted on federal charges alongside of Chauvin earlier this year. They're still on course for trial early next year on those charges. The state trial yet to come. So we're going to have to update on that later on. But in Minnesota, defendants with good behavior only serve about two years, uh, I'm sorry, two thirds of their sentence in prison and the remaining one third on parole. So Chauvin is actually expected to only serve about 15 years in prison and seven and a half years on parole. But then of course you add in the federal charges, which are under the sentencing guidelines, Chauvin could end up getting a federal penalty ranging from 27 to more than 33 years in prison with uh, credit for taking responsibility, says Mark Osler, a professor at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. Now, all right, so that, again, 27 to 33 years, that's on top of the 15 that he's uh, very, very likely to spend in prison. So we know the 15 is absolutely guaranteed, at least, and now you're looking at that range. Uh, now, the reason that there's a range and the reason that I'm not saying a concrete number for the federal charges is because the guidelines aren't mandatory. So Osler estimated that Chauvin would be sentenced toward the lower end of that, uh, end of that range. So at least 25 to 27 years federal prison. Uh, and now what's interesting here is, again, he pleaded guilty. So there will be no jury trial. None. So that's it. And basically, he did that to avoid the jury trial. Now, that, of course, could mean that he gets more years or, or than he would have gotten um, in a jury trial or, or less or less, really, depending on the jury that you would get. So I think he took a gamble and said, hey, look, uh, I'm going to get slaughtered in a jury trial. I I've already been uh, convicted of manslaughter. I this is not going to get any better. And so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna plead I'm just gonna plead out. Uh, now, as part of that plea deal, Chauvin also pleaded guilty to violating the rights of a then 14 year old boy during a 2017 arrest in which he held the boy by the throat, hit him in the head with a flashlight, and held his knee on the boy's neck and upper back while he was prone, handcuffed, and not resisting. Uh, because of course, yeah, of course. Uh, now, again, that's important. This guy has a history of brutalizing people. He really does. He really does. Uh, now, and he knows it. And this plea deal is, is basically him admitting to the fact that, yeah, I have no chance. Everybody can know, can, can see my history. I've already been judged guilty once. I'm not going to take that, up, uh, that, that thing again. I'm not going to take that chance. Now, in civil rights charges... And this is what's interesting about the law part of this, right? Um, you've got to have, I mean, you have a pretty high bar to prove that you violated someone's civil rights. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the details about that 
uh, in just a minute. But you got to have a lot of confidence about your case if you're a federal prosecutor trying to bring those civil rights charges against someone else. In fact, prosecutors have to believe that the officer acted under the color of the law or government authority and willfully depriving someone of their constitutional rights. That is a very, very high legal standard. So, for example, if this ended up being an accident, uh, like, uh, for example, Kim Potter, right? Uh, so Kim Potter shot Dante right in the back. So now she's an officer who is currently uh, on trial, I believe, as well, um, for shooting Dante right in the back as he was uh, driving away from his traffic stop. So she was the one who, on video, said that she was reaching for her taser, but then accidentally grabbed her gun. So that, knowing that case and how they would present that defense, would be more difficult to do a civil rights case on that because you can say, well, look, I, I made a mistake. Uh, you know, uh, it was an accident. I grabbed the wrong weapon. And so I don't know if that would be enough to convince a jury. You'd have to go through the whole trial, the whole, the whole motion, uh, et cetera, to figure that out, to suss that out, and, of course, to have a jury actually agree that. Now, uh, so uh, on these charges as well, it's not just an accident, but you could have bad judgment or simple negligence on the officer's part. Uh, they say it's not enough to support federal charges. Prosecutors, they say, have to prove the officer knew what he was doing wrong uh, or knew what he was doing was wrong in that moment, but then decided to do it anyway. So that's what they were going after Chauvin for before he pled out. Again, pleading out basically means, yeah, yeah, I knew what I was doing. I knew that it was wrong. I still did it anyway. And if I go to a jury trial, we think that the case against us is strong enough to find me guilty. I, I mean, again, that's pretty clear. That's a pretty clear admission right there. Uh, now, as first fellow officers, uh, you can you know, recall from the video that you had three different officers that were assisting in this as Chauvin was holding his uh, knee or kneeling on the neck of George Floyd. So his fellow officers, Kang and Lane, helped restrain Floyd as he was on the ground. Frank, uh, Kang felt uh, knelt on uh, Floyd's back. Lane held down Floyd's legs. And Tao held back bystanders and kept them from intervening. All former... Uh, all four former officers were charged broadly in federal court with the same charge, depriving Floyd of his rights while acting under the color of the law or government authority. The federal indictment, however, broke down the counts even further. The first count against Chauvin alleges that he violated his right to be free from unreasonable seizure and unreasonable force by a police officer when he kept that knee on Floyd's neck, even after Floyd was unresponsive. The second count alleges Chauvin willfully deprived Lo Floyd of liberty without due process, including the right to be free from deliberate indifference to his serious medical needs. And in the 2017 case against, uh, involving the four, then 14-year-old boy, Chauvin is charged with depriving the boy, who was both handcuffed and not resisting, of his right to be free of unreasonable force when he held him by the throat, hit him with a flashlight, and then did the knee on the neck while he was prone. So, now in that case, I don't know if you're familiar with that case. 27, right? Uh, 27, uh, I'm sorry, 2017. That's when it happened. The boy was 14 years old. He's a teenager. Now, of course, he's a black teenager. And so, Chauvin lied in his police report. Uh, he wrote that the teen had resisted and then... Um, pointed to the fact that, oh, this is, well, I, I didn't know there was a teenager. I mean, he was 6'2 and 240 pounds. I was very, very intimidated. So then I had to take somebody who was that big, but not resisting at all, and I had to beat him in the face with a flashlight. You know, because I was so scared. I was so afraid. Really? Really? And then used his own body weight to pin him to the floor. The boy ended up bleeding from the ear and needing two stitches, again, not resisting at all. 
That encounter was just one of many used in state court filings that prosecutors had showed Chauvin had used neck or head and upper body restraints seven times dating uh, before dating back to 2014, including the four times state prosecutors said he went too far and held the restraints beyond the point when such force was needed under circumstances. Again, having a long history, a very, very long history of doing police brutality. So now the guy's career is over. I mean, at, le at least there's that. That's a good thing. He's never going to be a cop again. Ever. Ever. And he shouldn't be. And, and look, he's going to be serving a very, very long time in prison, as he should. Again, we're looking at, what, 40 plus years, at least. Now, here's the thing, though. And, and, and this, is, this is related. This is tangential um, to the case. This should not be the be-all, end-all. And, and, and the reason that I point that out is because a lot of people are using this, this case, as like, a, well, we got him. We got him. Racism defeated. No. Police brutality defeated. We don't need to do anything else. No. No, I don't agree with that at all. I don't agree with that at all. Again, his crimes were so obvious that even he was like, no, no, I'm going to get destroyed by a jury. No, not at all. No, no. Um, now, in other cases, though, we do have a long way to go. In the case, it, 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 in considering how police officers treat black Americans, we have a really, really long way to go. And again, we haven't seen, since all of this happened, since the pro protests had happened, George Floyd, since the calls for police reform, we have seen absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And, and, that's, and that's really the problem here is the, is the system. It's systemic. Because Derek Chauvin is not an aberration. He is a product of this system. That's the problem. Okay. And again, we've got to get to root to the issue. We got to get to the root. And that's how the police are trained and the police and how they operate. Again, uh, police in this country are overfunded, over militarized, and overburdened with an expansive mission. Why are police doing home health checks? Why are they doing wellness checks? Why are they dealing with mentally ill people? Hmm? Why are they solving domestic disputes that are nonviolent? Why are they doing that? They shouldn't be. They should be out there solving crimes. They should be getting people to court as they're supposed to and maybe providing some security. That's what they should do. They don't need to be doing the jobs that social workers are doing and they don't need to be doing so being armed with deadly weapons. We don't need to be doing that. They also shouldn't be taught to use deadly force at any and all opportunities. We just shouldn't. They just shouldn't. And, and understand that like, again, they seem to be doing it a lot. There's a lot of high-profile cases here. They sh also shouldn't only be protecting property. They should be protecting human lives over property. Property can be replaced. Human lives can't. And so they should be saving lives. But again, they weren't set up to do that. They were set up originally to protect property and to bring property back, i.e. slaves. They were the original slave patrols. And so understand, like, there has to be a fundamental change in the way that policing is done in this country. And, and, and again, I, I bring this up because while the Chauvin verdict feels good, it is a form of justice, yes. Uh, the civil rights charges, I think, are a step in the right direction. I think he should spend the rest of his life in prison, honestly. Uh, but again, all that aside, understand that we have to go beyond Chauvin. We have to be, uh, go beyond all this. Because there are more potential Derek Chauvins out there. There are more people that are created by this system that are like this. Again, that's part of, they tried to argue that this is part of the training. Oh, we're trained to do this. Well, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. It, that has to change. That has to change greatly. We have to fundamentally question 
the role of the police in our society and what's actually causing the chauvins of the world to be created and to and to change that if we actually want to have policing be held up to the ideal that a lot of us grew up believing originally at least you know when it comes to the white community right um black community has always been uh pretty and and i hate to generalize too uh too much but i think it's fair to say that there's always been a little bit of distrust uh in especially the poor black community uh, the rich with the more wealthier black community i can see them seeing a little bit different um but again regardless here um is that we have to start seeing police different and seeing the role that police uh, play differently and try to change it to be more like the ideal that they're supposed to, protecting people over property, um, protecting lives, and actually helping people like they were supposed to. I'd love to see that there's uh, an actual officer friendly to everyone, not just people who look like you. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and share with your friends. You can subscribe and help out the channel by becoming a patron. It's patreon.com slash Jeff Waldorf, or you can become a channel member as well by hitting the join button below.